Welcome to the Swarm and Shoot podcast, episode four. In today's episode, I have Chris Shank with me, our offensive line coach. How's it going, Chris? Fantastic. Good. Well, it's, it's good to finally be coaching with you. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to have a good uh, opportunity to get to let our fan base out there know your background and some of your philosophies on coaching today. And I think in, initially what's interesting is that our common um, – acquaintance would be your father right. uh, and uh, Larry Shank is a longtime football coach and a very successful athletic director he, he had finished his career a year ago at Muskingum but he also recruited me to play at Capital University out of high school and he and my father were friends because they were initially they both coached in the Ohio Valley uh, in high school football and um, so I ended up at Capital you uh, were born sometime thereafter yeah. in that process and uh and you guys moved along the way uh through a, a college coach's path that your father took yeah. and i've always i've always thought it's interesting in this profession there's so many coaches out there yet very few of them are coaches sons and that's where i want to start this sure. kick this thing off and say look all right what was it like to grow up in larry shank's family <laughs> well, I mean, it, it it was unique. It was it was fun. Um, personally, I couldn't imagine a better childhood. Just you know, when we were at West Liberty, and I, it was probably when I got to be about five, six years old that he started taking me to preseason camp. And yeah, your dad was the head coach at West Liberty yes, he, at the yeah. time. Okay, go ahead. And uh, so he would take me to preseason camp. I'd ride my bike around, run around the track, do annoy the players and coaches and. Mm -hmm. All kinds. Of stuff. I mean, it was, it was. I mean, I can't imagine a better childhood. And then um, riding the buses to the games, or what, back home from the games, um, it, to to be able to grow up and not only have your dad eh, as a college football coach, which is pretty cool, but to sit around there and have all these eighteen to twenty two year old guys that you get to hang out with yeah. every day, and mm -hmm. you know, it's actually a funny story I tell about that. I was, I think I was seven years old. It was the first time I ever heard uh, the rap group NWA it was on the back of the okay. uh, <laughs> West Liberty <laughs> State bus. The, our, our, I'll never forget Daryl Dabney put his uh, headphones on me, asked me if I ever heard of NWA, and that's back when NWA was actually a professional wrestling. Oh, league, okay. Like, like WWF. Right. And I was okay. Like, I was like, oh, I mean, my dad watched it all the time. He goes, he just started <laughs> laughing. He goes, now listen to this. <laughs> My dad couldn't grab me out of that seat fast enough. So. <laughs> the but influence yeah, of yeah. college athletes. I yeah. Mean, yeah. So yeah. I mean, watched Scarface on that bus. Uh, yeah. About, about eight years old. You, you grew know, up so. fast. I did, you know. And so, <laughs> but, you know, with all that and all those experiences I had, you know, not only my dad, but then my mother as well, being allowing me to do that and experience that stuff. And, um, being as supportive as she was, what if I wasn't able to go to a game on the bus, she would take me or vice versa. You know, she'd pick me up if mm -hmm. I did and, and all that. So she let me experience everything. So. Yeah. No. And, and that's, that's, that's what's awesome yeah. about having that type of an environment that your mom would do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just so amazing that uh, I look forward to that because, you know, I've got Eli who, yeah. you know, is yeah. going to be seven now and, and uh, just to get him ex around our players and our coaches, he's already out watching Javon do drills and <laughs> yeah. learning stuff. So yeah. I think it, it's a really special um, opportunity you have yeah. when you've got someone that young and you can bring them up in such a great environment. Yeah. And, you know, as, as you guys, as you went through this, through your childhood and after high school, I know your father was still coaching at that yes. time right mm -hmm. and um he recruited you yeah right so it's <laughs> like okay dad's recruiting me where am i going so what did you end up doing your dad was at heidelberg at the time he right? was he was the head coach at heidelberg i think he was had been the head coach for one or two years by the time i got to be my senior year in high school and um you fell for the trap and went and played for him i didn't so i got, <laughs> I got the hell out of there and i went up going to muskingum it was just he was my little league coach in baseball and, and, and I mean, I love my dad to death and, but I always wanted to kind of go out and do my own thing. And he more than support, you know, he supported me and my mom. It was great. And actually I went down to Muskingum, 
close to the Ohio Valley, mm -hmm. uh, about 40 minutes away from my grandparents and all that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, so I was still close to family. So, yeah. So you go to Muskingum after you're done at Muskingum or toward the end of your career at Muskingum, yeah. your dad just shows up. Yeah. Tell us what that was like. Uh, it, was, it was unique. I, you know, I try to try to get the hell away from him and grow up on my own. And then next thing I know, he's uh, becomes the athletic director down at Muskingum. And um, it was right. I think the official hire was right after over Christmas break, my junior year. So it was a year and a half that he was there. And it was pretty, pretty neat because he was able then, he only ever got to watch me play college games on uh, when the film exchange and yeah. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it allowed him to watch me play my senior year. Um, obviously be able to go all the games oh, yeah. and all that stuff. And, and my mom too, because she would drive back. There was times my mom would, especially if one was playing at night, she would drive to that game and then, or drive to the day game and drive to the night game. Whoa. And like, so, I mean, it, it was a lot easier on her too. So, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. So he comes there and then, now it's time for you to get into your coaching career right. at that point. You, you say, Hey, I'm going to usually you start off as a GA if you can somewhere. So where do you go after Muskingum? I went back to Heidelberg. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so, a tie back and forth. Yeah, right? So I just went back and forth to it. So yeah, I had a couple uh, opportunities and with guys I had coached with or, or for my dad. And um, I just felt that going back up to Heidelberg and being in the OAC and in, in that conference was and it's even the coach, the head coach that was there at the time. I mean, it was, it was a great move for me, the whole mm -hmm. coaching staff. So, so when you wrap up and you and you finish up your GA ship at Heidelberg, um, now you're into the world that so many GAs are in. It's like, what do I do next? Either get a full time job, you know, because you're in the small college yeah. level, or you try to gun for something out there, get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. So you got out of your comfort zone a little bit. I did. Right, you I applied did. all over the place, and oh. where did you end up? I, uh, I ended up going to Lehigh University as the assistant offensive line coach. So I was mm -hmm. actually the defensive line coach at at Heidelberg, and um, so I was interviewed for the assistant defensive line job. Obviously, didn't get it, but they had just had a offensive intern, restricted earnings coach leave, and. Coach Lembo, Pete Lembo at the time, and Coach Powers, who I hit it off with on my interview as the offensive line coach, they saw that you know I played tight end. My dad was an offensive line coach, mm -hmm. and I I expressed to them that eventually I wanted to become an offensive line coach, and oh. so it was a pretty great. Pretty, so you get to hang out with John Powers, <laughs> yeah. right? A oh, legend yeah. in his own right. Oh yeah, you know, great great offensive line coach yeah. who. Yeah, I had a little. I had met him before when my brother Jimmy was a defensive coordinator at Wagner okay. University on Staten Island. So somehow through that East Coast connection, I, I know John. Um, he had grown up um, in Media, Pennsylvania, which yeah. is just outside of uh, Philadelphia, and uh, so you know, it's like so we have these common occurrences where we get to know each other through other people, right? Yeah. And and as I and I see this. It, it, and throughout that process, for whatever reason, your dad and I always just kept in touch, even if it was like the annual call or what was going on. And, and um, you know, because there's a certain bond you have with somebody that recruits you to right. go play college football. And we always had that. And, you know, he's giving me your career updates. You know, you're, you go from Lehigh, you have some stuff going on. The next thing you know, you're moving again. Yeah. I, I, I ended up going down, so I would go from the Midwest to the East Coast, then to the South, into the mountains of Tennessee for, for yeah. seven years. So. What was Sewanee like? It was, it, it was a great place, yeah. but very, very small, um, very high academic, which academically, the, the atmosphere that you're in, the environment that you're in, very similar to, to Lehigh. Mm -hmm. Um but being Division Three, and my knowledge of being Division Three, being the OAC, it was not that. <laughs> so it was uh, it was a little bit different, you know, getting used to yeah. the, to that type of uh, football at that level. So oh sure, yeah, and I know it's beautiful down there, and, yeah. and there, there's and every school has its. Um, positive attributes and and right. and i think the academics there certainly was oh, it yeah. You know? absolutely yeah so so after you had left sewanee then what did you do after i left sewanee um 
I was there for seven years, and the offensive line coach that I I played tight end in college, but you know we did a lot of our drills yeah, with the line. Sure. So got to know the offensive line coach, Coach Kayser. He retired, and again, it was one of those things where I, I was at Swine for seven years. You know, I need to make a move, and so um, I thought it was just kind of a, a natural thing. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, this job's opening up. Back in my alma mater which so happened to be my dad's actual last year. So oh, yeah. he comes to Muskingum for my senior year playing. I go to Muskingum to coach for his last year as the athletic Yeah, director. his senior year. His there senior, you go. Yeah, okay. His, yeah, his senior year plus 12. So yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, so you go back to Muskingum. Yeah. You're home. Your parents are there. You're coaching mm-hmm. the Muskies. And you, know, you, you go through some transition there, right? Because okay. – there, there was there was a coaching change yeah. during that process, was there not? There was. Um, it would have been right after Thanksgiving. The the president and everybody they let Coach Logan go. He yeah, Al Logan. For, yeah, yeah, for eleven, twelve years, mm-hmm. something like that. And uh, and so that was in the beginning of December, early November, and then um, yeah, we didn't have a head coach until almost April then. Yeah. So it was, it was a unique wow, that's situation. a long time to yeah. wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you sit there, you get a new head coach, yeah. you go through the process of that first year, mm-hmm. right? And then I think I had called you because I got this. I got the Defiance College job right. very late. It was right. the end of July, mm-hmm. and uh, I you're one of the first people I called, mm-hmm. and I said, "Hey, you want to come work up here yeah. together?" And you were already like, "I mean, you guys are just going for meetings." It was. Yeah. It was late in the process, and, you know, it was your alma mater. You know, I sensed that, yeah, you couldn't really do it at that time, yeah. which which I understand. I mean, there was a loyalty, and it, it's hard. You know, it was hard for me to get guys at that point, oh, yeah. you know. So you go through the season, and I I don't think I waited a day till after our season was over. I think I called you shortly thereafter. No, I think you even may have texted me like like, like, like last week yeah. of the season, and then yeah. – I came off the road recruiting from Dayton and you were at my parents' house talking with my dad. Like, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to, so, sometimes uh, a head coach, you have to recruit yeah, coaches, yeah, right? So, so yeah. Next so, thing I know, I'm at a shady side high school playoff game. That's right. Yeah. We did that. Yeah. We were down there and yeah. we, you know, we, we got to connect again yeah. and uh, you know, shortly thereafter you decide, Hey, that's uh, you wanted to make this move because you, you wanted I don't know, maybe you were intrigued by what was going on up here. Uh, What really made you decide to leave a place that you graduated Mm -hmm. from and your family's there and all these things to move to Northwest Ohio to black swamp country? (laughs) Why did you do that? Uh, You know, it it was... I did one. I, I, when I was at, going back to when I was at Swan, I fell into a comfort zone there Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that uh, again, and I thought this was a great opportunity. I, I came up here to kind of, and when I first came up here to check it out after mm-hmm. we, after that playoff game we went to, you know, I was kind of, I was probably about fifty percent either way, you mm-hmm. know, and sitting down talking with you and hearing some of your ideas for the program, and the one thing that probably pushed it over the top was when I told you that, you know, I want to make sure that we sit, you know, like we're going to meet about the offense. We know this, not just the offensive line, but the, yeah, yeah. the, the receivers, of course, skill guys. And you told me, don't worry about it. I know this like the back of my hand, but my goal is to make you a great head coach. And that's mm-hmm. ultimately what I've always wanted to be. And so to have somebody that wants to help mentor oh, yeah. and get me to where I want to get to, you know. Yeah. Well, so you, you know, I'm fortunate because I work for, you know, a hall of fame coach, right. Bill Snyder. And yeah. it was like, when you're around a guy like that, you realize you're only as good as your coaches and you want, and, and you want to help them grow right. professionally and every way that's important to them, you know, and, and, and we do a lot of different things here, yeah. you know, and, and I think, you know, I, well, one of the things I think that we sort of hit um, on the safe wavelength wavelength on uh, are like, things like staff development, leadership, creating the culture <clears throat> from the top down and from the bottom up. You know, we call it extreme ownership, you know. And um, 
you know, I thought that was a, that was a connection. And, you know, how has that been? Because, you know, you got here at the new year. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been basically together, you know, for about half a year now. Mm-hmm. And, and what have you noticed regarding that as opposed to what you may have gotten somewhere else? Or, you know, yeah. what, what, what about it? As far as the, the, yeah, the development, staff development, leadership, stuff like, things like that. I mean, it's – we the other staffs I've been on, we haven't ever really done – much in the way of leadership development, staff development, and all that stuff. So when we start reading books like Pound the Stone, Extreme Ownership, which I actually, like you're saying, I had already yeah. read that before yeah. before coming into it. Now you're talking about it and discussing it. I mean, it, it just takes it to a different level outside of just X's and O's and recruiting good players. Yeah. You know, and it starts to give you a sense of how to interact with people, how to talk to people, how to get people to follow you and um, work together, you Mm -hmm. know? So, um, you know, as we read more books and I mean, (laughs) I even started, you know, going out and, um, you know, buying books, like different presentations, you know, my first, my first recruiting presentation. Next thing Mm -hmm. I know I'm getting, critiqued on my recruiting presentation by Oops, a book sorry. Written, written, <laughs> written by Steve Jobs. Yeah. Yeah. There you so go. Then, so yeah. then I go out and buy the book. So to, yeah. to try to make myself a little bit better doing that stuff. So yeah. yeah. Cause it's always, to me, it's always a constant state of correction in the process of improving yourself. And I think as a staff, we have a group of guys that are aligned that way because I, I've personally looked for those kind of guys. Cause I don't want a guy that just is happy with where he is. I want a guy that, wants to achieve beyond you know even what he thinks he can achieve because I've always thought when you're when you're working with a player or as a head coach you're working with an assistant it's like to me it's like I, you think you you want to be here my goal for you is I want you there right. you know I want I want to expand some things that you're thinking about so you are not just really good you're outstanding in your field and I think that as a head coach to any of our assistant coaches I think that's what makes our players better. Right. I mean, because we all want to recruit talent and you're the recruiting coordinator. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And and we want to get that talent and you have to have talent. Let's not oh, yeah. get anything wrong here. You have to have talent, but it's what you do when you get them here because they come from so many different backgrounds and every kid's a little different, you know? Oh, everybody learns different, you know, receives information different. It's, and you know, I have to know how to deal or work with, you mm-hmm. know, those types of personalities. So, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Get, get your information across. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's been fun yeah. though. I mean, I, we've had, uh, I think we've had a good campaign. Um, you know, I always, uh, you know, we look at really, this is year one coming up right. for me because I'm looking at the last year getting in so late we're okay. we're, we're going to be able to get this year one up and running and have some fun with it. Right. But, um, you know, is, is when we come back in a second, um, I want to delve into coaching offensive line with you. So those recruits out there and our fan base understand what is it you're trying to get out of offensive line and what you're looking for. Okay. So uh, we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. This is Manny Matsakis, the head football coach of the Defiance College Yellow Jackets. Defiance College is located in beautiful Northwest Ohio. We have a tremendous campus here, and we're led by Dr. Rich Ann Mankey, our president. Her team has created a renaissance here in recent years that has built our reputation on academics and student life. We have a wonderful opportunity here for you to find your life's calling. Make sure for you to become a Yellow Jacket, you take the time to contact one of our friendly admissions counselors so they can walk you through the process to find your life's calling and become a Yellow Jacket. Welcome back. And uh, Chris, let's talk about offensive line play. And you know, I think you realize my philosophy on offensive linemen is, to me, they drive the bus. Oh. I mean, it is by far the most important position on the team. You can get by with other guys at, a, at any position with some talent, but if you've got an offensive line, you can control the game and you can have a great defense because you're controlling the game on offense. Yeah. 
you know, and, and you, all this stuff. I've, I've never seen a championship football team without a tremendous offensive line. So what are you looking for when we're out recruiting and we're putting together an offensive line for this season? I mean, you know, you look at offensive linemen, obviously, you know, you love your tackles being 6'4", 6'5", 285, 290 pounds. You know, your, your guards a little shorter could be 6'1", 6'2", you know, 290, mm-hmm. you know, smart center, the whole thing. Um, but I like talking when I talk, when, when recruiting an offensive line, especially at the early stages, and you, you talk to a high school coach or you talk to um, – somebody that has anything to do with it with a player with a young man is how coachable is he you know mm-hmm. I, I can you know I, I i can sacrifice some on especially you know at this level with, with some of the size but if a young man is coachable and i can talk to him and i can get some what i'm trying what i see and what you know my ideas across to him he's got a chance now to be a little bit better yeah i want somebody that's got it's flexible yeah, he's not going to be just your, you know, it's going to be good in the weight room, but it's not just going to be your weight room here that goes in there and doesn't warm up. He's got some mobility to him, mm-hmm. you know, because you got to be in, back to actually the second offensive line coach that I worked for at Lehigh. You know, he always, for some reason, it just always rings in my ear. You, know, you, you got to be a bender. You want to be a good offensive lineman, you got to be a bender. You know, getting underneath somebody, being able to lift that defender, mm-hmm. the whole thing. So, um. You know, you got to be intelligent, and that goes back to being coached. You got to mm-hmm. be able to see the defense, read the defense. Where's this guy going? You know, not only just the guy across from you, but you know, as I'm teaching protections, especially in the past, you know, tackles, just being able to read safeties and you know, as the mm-hmm. secondary linebackers and where people are coming from to make appropriate calls, get people in the right spot. So, all that stuff. Um, you know. It, it, and then you got to have great feet. Yeah. Gotta work on your feet. No, no, no. It's, again, you can be big and you can be strong, but you can be big and strong at a bad offensive lineman. Yeah. You if you can't move, feet. you can't play. You got to move, you got to bend, you got to know where the hell you're going. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and why you're going there. That's so. right. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot involved. And I think people don't realize that the skill level of great offensive linemen. Yeah is remarkable. I mean, when you see the, these guys that play at the highest levels of college or professional, it's like you, you, you really get an understanding like, oh my, you've got all this mass. These guys are moving in, you know, as a unit, doing whatever they're doing in the run game. The pass protection, which is opposite of run game because you, you've got to be able to, to get your body in the proper position to keep guys off the quarterback. Okay. You know, the, the, it's not easy and I've always thought that um, as far as a unit goes, offensive line is the most intricate of all positions, you know, I mean, because the great O-line coaches make a difference. You got five guys doing five completely opposite things just about, you know, yeah. outside of blocking somebody. Sure, <laughs> yeah. Know, what they're looking at. I mean, and they're in such a closed, confined space that they have to work together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, this tackle over here, he may be making a call that's going to affect the center right here, but he's got a guy right on top of him that, yeah. you know, oh, shit, I got to. You yeah. Know, so right? there's a yeah. lot of working parts. And, oh, you know, it's, absolutely. And, and that that's what I think our fan base is. You start to see how our line is going to be playing. And it is. It, there is a lot of improvement that will happen this first year with this offensive line that uh, will ultimately get us to a championship caliber football program. And. You know, I I believe not only that, that it, there's a certain amount when you've got your own room and you're leading these guys, it, 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 there, there's, there's a, always a great camaraderie with great offensive linemen. Oh, it's the best up meeting room in football. Right? <laughs> no, that's the best, yeah. It is. The positional meeting room. I know. It's I fun. used to get jealous all the time when I was uh, at different places coaching and you know, as a head coach, I'd sit in the O line meeting and say, "Man, this is the best." No, it's just great. a great atmosphere. That's one thing that, again, I've taken yeah. from my father because I sat in how many practices that I go to of his or sit in meetings. And one thing I'm 
he said the big one of those biggest mistakes of his coaching career is the one year at West Liberty where he decided to coach quarterbacks, not the offensive line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, from tough guys uh, to yeah, prima donna, yeah, yeah. it's a totally different ball so, game uh, so, coaching yeah, those yeah. quarterbacks. And yeah, you know, and, and the quarterback position is different in and of itself because it's it is easily the most difficult position to play in all of sports because so much is coming at you you know so there's a lot of things that go into running a great offense so you're talking about a couple of these positions there that will certainly make a difference this fall oh absolutely yeah now let's uh, shift gears a little bit now and talk about defiance the town of defiance so you get here and this is no disrespect to any town you've been in before you know but what is what are some of the things you notice from a standpoint of you got here it's like you had no idea about this awesome town and what there is to do and and so forth no i grew up uh an hour from here maybe a little bit over an hour from here and um i i heard always heard of defiance i knew of defiance i thought it was some Mm-hmm. cow town pasture just kind of like yeah. out in the middle of nowhere and um when i first came up here and saw it i was like i had no idea that this town was like this and there's a lot of stuff to do here i mean it's if you take the last two towns i lived in combined which would be new concord ohio and swanee tennessee you know defiance is probably about 10 times bigger than both of them combined wow yeah so <laughs> you know it's uh I haven't lived around much of a nightlife, but <laughs> <laughs> but a social atmosphere. But, but I mean, it's it's nice that there's an escape. You know, you sitting here working and recruiting, and you, whether you're or a student athlete and you doing homework and studying and training, you can go over. There, there's plenty of stuff for you to do right here in town. And then you know, on top of that, the, the support and kind of just genuine excitement that were the direction this program was headed to. I haven't been around that really at any program I've been involved in, mm-hmm. you know, as you, as you go and, Oh, you coach, coach at defiance. And yeah. People are just, yeah. People so are excited, excited around yeah. here. It's, it's going to be a crazy. fun season to, to make all this yeah. happen. And I, you know, as you say this, you know, and as we close this out today, mm-hmm. I, I want to make sure people understand that our coaching staff is all in, Oh, yeah. We love it here. Yeah. You know, it's it's a good up because people really make a place. Yeah. And that's why even those other places you're at, they're, they're special in their own way because of the people. That's what you remember more than anything else. So, but we are fortunate. We have a town with a lot of stuff in it. Yes. And, and it's an opportunity for student athletes to come here, get a great degree and, and go on and find their life's calling when they finish up in the program. And I think that's why we do college football. That's why our staff is connected to do this. And, um, you know, as we move forward, it's going to be a lot of fun to see things transpire throughout the fall. And, um, you know, and I think in this podcast, it's, it, it, I really want everybody that's listening to this to make sure you um, go on iTunes, subscribe, you know, follow us on that Facebook page, Swarm and Shoot, which will give you some updates there and make some comments when you look at the uh, when you subscribe on iTunes. I think that that will actually help us to reach more people when you do that, because it'll drive us up the search engine of new and noteworthy. So and use a noteworthy. So it's like it's pretty interesting to do that. And we're having fun with that. And I think the next episode We'll have for us Javon Johnson, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, here's a guy that was, you know, I had the privilege of being on a staff that coached him in the Canadian Football League, and um, you know, he in 2000, that was in 2009. Then I believe in 2011, he was the CFL Player of the Year on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, of course, we always kid him when you go into the offices where you guys are all up there. And, you know, before we moved into the new offices, you know, he's got this Heisman Trophy looking thing on his desk. You know, it's like you just want to pet it when you go by. (laughs) But Javon's great. And I think everybody gets along good. And uh, I'm excited for the next episode with Coach Johnson. And uh, I just want to thank uh, Chris for coming on this episode. Oh, great to be here. So great to be here. So right, on the show and shoot. in the town. So <laughs> and at Defiance College. Here so. we go. Absolutely right. awesome.